glad to be here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So yeah, I'm a poet and a historian and an accidental uh, atheist priest. Uh, I didn't mean it, but it happened. Um, so what happened is 20 years ago, um, I wrote a book called Doubt, A History. And since then, I've been invited to give talks to atheist groups and um, irreligious houses of worship and universities all over the country and all over the world, really. And, um, and I was shocked at how personal some of the questions were, given that, especially in the beginning, my talks were very much about history and a little bit of philosophy. Well, it started right away at one of my very, the very first large hauled out talk um, at Caltech. Uh, I'm signing books afterwards, and up comes this terrifically pregnant couple, and they ask if they can ask a question. I figure it's going to be something about Darwin or Einstein. No, can they have a bris? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> But I realize that as a historian, I do have an answer for them, okay? They're atheists. They don't believe in God. Their whole families are believing Jews. They had been believing Jews. And they genuinely do not want to insult their beautiful ex-religion. Nor do they want to be blasphemous to rationalism, to what they really believe. So they're asking me what I think, because they've sussed from my talk that I'm one of the rare atheists that isn't exactly against religion <laughs> and certainly isn't against ritual. Um, in, in a sense, once you get past a certain point, once you get past the, the political debate, you can look around and say, hey, rel religion was a human construction. We made it. And if we drop it because we don't believe in the supernatural part, we may be dropping other parts that are helpful to human beings, right? That help us thrive, community, ritual, meditation. So they're asking me if they can have a bris. I say, mazel tov, go ahead. I can tell they want to. Um, and uh, I don't see any problem with it. But as they're leaving, I say, oh, but add a poem. I think about the, the rituals I've been to where Everybody, everybody involved doesn't believe in God and the ritual, the only thing they're saying that's strengthening everybody is something about God, gonna help them raise the child or deal with the death or deal with, or, or keep the marriage going. So when I'm at a, at a ritual where someone breaks out a poem, I don't mind if they do the God thing too. I, I don't happen to. Um, I think it's nice for everybody to have a good time, whatever. But at least have something there that if you don't believe in God, there's something rich and uplifting there for you. So I say, add a poem. You know, and they turn around and I say, Whitman? And again, they're sort of heading out and I say, wait, there's a part in Leaves of Grass where he puts this question separate, and then he says this description of himself and life, which are just utter despair. He just feels terrible. He's rotten. The world's rotten. Why bother? Why do it? What is it for? And then Whitman has answer, and then just these two lines, that you are here, that life exists and identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. You know, they look at me and I look at them and the people around us and there's a feeling, you know, that you may contribute a verse. Um, it kept happening. Well, I'll say my husband, John, was there uh, and he turned to me after they left and said the only thing missing was the word Rebbe. You know, I was like, yeah, what just happened there? Um, so uh, people kept asking me questions about life rituals and about holidays, how to manage families that had different beliefs, and also how to manage their own conflicting beliefs and feelings. But, and then I also I would start with history and end up giving them a poem, because they were in pain. Look, history cured me. History helped me. Learning how many different religions there are and how many of them don't have an afterlife and you just tilt your attention elsewhere. 
Um, the abyss becomes really just a, a shadow from having stared at heaven too long. There's nothing there. Um, just turn away. Uh, so, but, but that doesn't help people fast, the history stuff. What helps people fast is the poetry. And I always, because I'm a poet, because I read poetry, because poetry helps me, I was giving that away. So there were also questions, well, more comments on existential issues. They weren't asking, they were telling me. So uh, there was one where um, an older gentleman raises his hand after the talk and says, you know, that I'm completely mistaken. You cannot have um, meaning without God. You cannot have the idea of community without God. That without God, we are islands. We are totally alone. And he's, he's citing this centuries old idea of, of that without God we're islands. It's, it's an old notion. Um, and the separation that that entails. And luckily I just happened to think of this poem by Muriel Rukeyser and we all looked it up. And the first stanza goes, and I read it aloud, islands, oh for God's sake they're connected underneath. Well, the man laughs, and because of his openness, because in that moment he was able to hear that the rest of the audience was loving on him, not laughing at him, because there was this awe in it as well, the sigh of awe and wonder, as well as there, he laughed, and it let us all laugh, and there was a feeling, again, this feeling in the room, because we are connected, and when we try to connect, it shows, it happens. The magic doesn't always work, but it can. Um, for me, the, uh, the magic also sort of worked through words. Uh, I grew up on Long Island um, in a Jewish household. My mother believed, my father uh, was a scientist atheist, right? But my mom was in charge of us. So I believed until I had a sort of moment at age 12, um, kind of moment that young people have where you suddenly see a certain slant of light and the beauty shocks you. Um, and I just suddenly realized I could have born, been born anywhere else in the world and I would have believed what they believed there. And it was terribly troubling but also very freeing. But I was upset afterwards, and I was a little lost. I had thought that life was a riddle that you could solve and that now there wouldn't be a solution. Um, and I was already working hard at that age, and it seemed kind of rough. And one day I'm standing in front, I'm standing in the middle school library in front of the little section of poetry, and I take out this book literally called Poetry for Depressed Teenagers. <laughs> Okay, I've tried to find it, and it can't have been titled that, but it was something very close, okay? And I take it out, and I'm teen sure nothing the adult world is gonna have is gonna help me. And I'm looking through, and nothing does help me. And out wafts a little piece of paper, having been cut out of another source by vigorous use of a blue ballpoint pen. And it wafts out, and I go pick it up, and it's this quote by Raina Maria Rilke. And I thought she was pretty cool until I found out they just give German boys Maria as a middle name. <laughs> and the quote, the quote says, be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions. Do not seek now for the answers because the answers could not be given you because you have not lived them. And the point is to live everything. So live the questions now and perhaps you will, some distant day, without even noticing it, live into the answers. <sighs> I was solved. It wasn't like it took a while. Boom. I just said, oh, I can live the questions. I can, this I can do. I get this. And I held that piece of, you know, I kept that piece of paper for, for decades. Um, so here I am, an adult. I'm a poet. I'm a historian. I was formed by poetry. I'm giving prescriptions of poetry to people. And of course, I start thinking deeply about the way that ritual and poetry works together in religion, but also out of religion from the Pledge of Allegiance to poetry at, a, at a, an you know, inauguration. Um, we, we know that it's a way of creating a very, well, I rehabilitate the word sacred in my new book, The Wonder Paradox. It's a sacred moment. The word sacred predates the religious use, started out as treaty. 
Because, you know, something very holy between two people. Yeah, you killed mine, I killed yours, we won't do it anymore. <laughs> and if you can make that treaty once, you can carry its name to a new place and hallow new ground. The sacred really matters. And it isn't religious, it's what we hold sacred. And so I'm thinking about all this and I'm realizing that science isn't enough for me. I don't believe the religion, supernatural part. Science isn't enough because of the wonder paradox. Well, because of all the paradoxes. We mostly live in the human experience and the human experience is full of paradox. We are ambitious mortals. Go, go do with something, something with that, right? We're already ambitious and mortal, right? We also conscious, a paradox is when two things are true and you put them next to each other and they cannot both be true. They cancel each other out and yet they don't. Um, think about meat for a second, a hamburger, or you have some right here, just give it a pinch. Do you see any chance that it can think? Meat can't think. Yeah, but the meat thinks. The meat has done all the thinking. It's written all the songs. These globs of gray goo that don't even last very long, they sort of have to hand it off to each other. That has created all the music and all the books and the whole astounding modern world. That's the consciousness paradox. Consciousness is weirder than virgin birth. I mean, come on. I can imagine virgin birth, right? A couple of cells start to divide on their own, fine. But the meat thinks? That I cannot imagine. I could spend a thousand years in a lab trying to make meat think, and I'm not gonna do it, but my dumb body did it twice. They're back there. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking about the consciousness paradox, but also the wonder paradox. The fact that we material beings evolved into into creatures that have awe and wonder, that look up at the night sky and see a white stripe and slowly come to realize that it's stars and eventually to understand that we're in a galaxy. And that's the side of it. The whole idea that we can fit ourselves into rationality just doesn't quite work, and yet I want nothing really from religion except, well, all its good practices. Um, so, I really came to writing this book, The Wonder Paradox. It was kind of a coming together of all these different things, but it was that people were asking me questions all the time. So there are 20 chapters, and they are 20 of the questions or problems that have been brought to me. One of the most straightforward is the problem of shame. A lot of us feel shame a lot of the time. We don't know what to do with it. The modern world has nothing for it, really, except confessing. I mean, so in the 20 chapters, the chapter on shame, as in all the chapters, I sort of tell a story, then I tell how different religions around the world have solved that, and different religions around the world all have things for shame. They're mostly about fasting or giving something up or water. Swimming in the Ganges, the Ganges will clean you from sin but also to go to a Shinto temple, you step over those rivulets because they clean you. Because fasting and water are the two big ways that we do this. You can't get your hands clean from thinking about washing them, and maybe you can't get your heart clean either. You maybe have to do something, or at least if nothing else is working, get up and do something. And here's what the religions, these ancient human practices have offered. So, In the shame chapter, I close with the poem of, each chapter has a poem that I look at, and that one I look at um, Shakespeare's When in Disgrace with Fortune in Men's Eyes, I Alone Beweep My Outcast State. He, he, he went at myself almost despising, happily, accidentally, I think on thee, and then my soul like a lock unto the break of day arising sings hymns at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that I would scorn to change my state with kings. That is an incredible statement by a guy who is the absolute top of accomplishment of all time. The man hates himself. It really ought to show us that if he hates himself, we must be all right. This must be a feature of the program and we just have to cope with it, right? So, I now, I think back, that baby that was 
in utero at the beginning of the story is 20 years old now. And I wonder what we're giving the next generation to believe in. You know, humanism just as such sounding like that, it's not enough. I think about the wonder that we're living in, the amazing infinitesimal and the in, in, intensely gigantic and all the wonders of being and recreating and babies and death and the whole magical part and that we somehow hold each other together and that for God's sake they are connected underneath and that we can live the questions and that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. Thanks.